on this edition of Independent Sources. It's in the bag. Continued controversy over a new bill that levies a fee on shoppers who use plastic and paper bags. And going for gold. The effort to recognize a legendary platoon of Puerto Rican soldiers from World War I finally bears fruit. The details coming up. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The City Council recently approved a hotly contested bill that will allow grocery store owners to level a five cents fee on each plastic or paper bag their customers use. The bill's proponents say that it is a means of alleviating the city's massive trash problem. Opponents claim that this charge is regressive and will impact the city's poor. I sat down with Jenny Romer, the founder and director of the website, who has been a major supporter of the bill. We talk about the impetus behind the law and why it may still be flawed. Jenny Romer, thanks for joining us. So uh, in talking about this uh, plastic bag fee uh, tax that the city wants to impose on um, consumers, um, what the opponents of, of the bill have said that one of the problems is that it's going to be an economic hardship to poor people that five cents per bag is a lot of money for poor people. And so what do you say to that argument? I'd say that that argument is mostly coming from the plastics industry and groups that are associated with them. Um, but it is, it is a real concern for New Yorkers. But we've worked on this bill for three years and have made a lot of very careful adjustments to the bill in order to address low-income communities specifically. But the main thing is it's not meant for people to pay five cents of the register. It's meant to make people not want to pay it and therefore not get a single-use bag. So either just not get a, a bag if they're getting an item or two or remembering to bring a reusable bag when they're going on major grocery shopping mm -hmm. trips. Mm -hmm. So some people question, you know, how much of an environmental impact will this have? Mm -hmm. Well, plastic bags are very, like, particularly problematic. So the city has to, the city's the one that has to address them. Um, the main thing is litter. Plastic bags are very uniquely aerodynamic. They're so thin that they easily get caught up in the wind and they end up in places where they shouldn't be, like in trees and waterways and storm drains. And the city is the one that's charged with cleaning those up. And they also are bad for recycling generally because the plastic bags that are in the waste stream, in the recycling stream, clog the machinery. So the city has to, or the city's man, uh, recycler Sims has to shut down the line and clean out the plastic bag film from the machine gears. Um, so it's something that costs the city money. It's not just that it doesn't look good, um, but that it depends on a lot of people have different motivations. Sure. Um, but, that, but what but about economics, the argument or the question, the environmental impact, whether mm -hmm. this is really helping the environment? Right. Uh, so we've seen all over the all over the country where if you put a really small charge on on single use bags, that there are huge reductions in in plastic bag use and also in the percentage of in, in plastic bag litter. So in South, San Jose, California, there is a ban on thin plastic bags and a charge for all other bags. And there the, we saw a reduction of 59 percent. Uh, in plastic bag litter on the streets and 89% in storm drains within the first year. So part of the argument then for you is not so much as an environmental issue, it's just like it, it costs municipalities money to clean these things up? Right, that's a big part of it and it's because people don't really think when they're at the register about whether they want a bag or not or whether they need one. It's just an automatic thing where the cashier gives you a bag even if you are just getting a bottle of soda or a bag of chips or something at a bodega. There's just no thought to whether you get it and people don't see it as having a value. And some people litter it, other people if they dispose of it properly it's so thin it blows away. And so it's something that you can address. We've seen that you can address it pretty easily by just putting a charge on it. In Washington, D.C., they saw an immediate 60 percent reduction. And we saw that people felt generally good about it. Like people either felt good about it or were, were neutral. And we saw that across in Washington, D.C. They did a study and we saw it across all um, race groups uh, because that was one of the things they specifically looked at in D.C. was who 
whose behavior does this change? And we saw that it changed, it changed across all uh, race and economic groups. And so with New York's bill, um, there is going to be a similar study to look at what, what impacts does this really have on consumer behavior after a couple of years? And also, you know, just to specifically address the, the argument that this would disproportionately affect low-income people, um, New York City Council members made sure to include um, outreach and education specifically to low-income communities within 200% of the federal poverty line to do reusable bag giveaways because it's not, because you know, I have a lot of reusable bags. <laughs> Whenever I go to an event, there's a reusable bag, exactly. and maybe uh, a water uh, bottle that I get true. for free. <laughs> but, you know, the people that really don't already have reusable bags, um, getting bags into their hands is Let's something the city is going to work uh, uh, is working real on. Life, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. go, ahead. go ahead. Real life example, most people, most people in the boroughs outside of Manhattan, even in Manhattan, mm -hmm. <laughs> upper Manhattan, you go to your local bodega, I mean, as a matter of routine for small things, mm -hmm. and they give you a bag there. Mm -hmm. And the argument is, you know, if I am I going to drag a reusable bag to the corner bodega just because I'm going to save five cents? And how do you address that reality? Well, I think the bigger reductions that we that we've seen in other places with just the corner stores, we don't call them bodegas other places we've <laughs> seen, but the the corner store type of places in in other cities is that. People just don't get a bag when they're getting an item or two. Like if you're going to eat what you're buying at the bodega soon, you don't get a bag. Or you don't, you don't necessarily have to always carry around what people consider a reusable bag. It could be a backpack or a, woman, a lot of women like myself carry around rather large purses that you can put something in. Um, but, you know, there are also a variety of reusable bags that if people are getting more than a thing or two that they can um, bring with them. But it is, it's a... We're looking, to, this bill is looking to change consumer behavior. It's looking to change that dynamic of the at the cash register from just getting that bag that you're maybe you're gonna throw away as soon as you leave the store um, versus having the cashier ask you, do you wanna buy a bag for that? And when people are presented with that, do you wanna pay five cents for a bag that you're gonna use for two seconds? It really ch changes the way that people think about, um, think about those bags. But if you're going to the grocery store, um, you're, you know, people hate the idea of paying for it so much that you're probably only going to go to the store once or twice and be faced with this prospect of having to pay for multiple bags, then you're going to start bringing your own. So we want to make sure the city's doing outreach to, the, to people that, that don't already have bags, that to give them a variety of, of you know, options. reusable bag sure. options sure. Um, without well, having we, to spend we, money. We, we, Unfortunately, we don't have someone from the plastic industry with us in studio. Uh, I did That's some. Too bad. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that I have to become mm -hmm. uh, their uh, spokesperson, if you will. But uh, seriously, uh, one of the arguments that I read from from their literature is that you know these plastic bags have multi-use. One of them is a lot of us who have pets use them to pick up the the uh, the waste that the dogs will generate, and, that, and then they think that's the legitimate use of it, and so mm, y this bill will crimp that use of the, of the bag. Well, that's one thing we very specifically looked at with city council when adopting this fee ordinance is because the other type of ordinance that's proven to work very well is a ban on thin plastic bags and a charge on everything else. But we specifically made it just be a fee on all bags, a five cent fee. So if you, you know, if you're planning to reuse your bag either as a trash can liner, which a lot of people do, I even yeah. do that, uh, or to clean up after your dog, you have the option to still get it for five cents and you might say, remember, like that a certain store has one that you like more than others so you can go there or you can just or you can buy a separate you know bulk roll that's cheaper than that for your bag or for sorry for your for your dog or for your trash liner um, but uh, also there, there are going to be bags that are available for free in some places like you can still get um, so basically Fred you're bag. not saying it's it's not a financial uh, hardship on the average New Yorker, is that your... No, opinion? it's not. It, but it's just, it makes people be much more mindful, pay much more attention to to whether they need plastic bags. And they and, and much more resourceful. So you prop, or a lot of people now throw away the, the bag that bread comes in. Maybe they'll save that and use it for, for pet waste because they you know, aren't going to want to spend money to get another bag. 
Um, so it's something where we've seen in other places people really don't like the idea at first because they don't like the idea of having to pay for something they see no value in. But when they notice less plastic bag litter on the streets um, and they see that it is not very difficult to change that well, behavior. They cha people change their tune and generally in places where this has been adopted, it's a popular law. On Monday, the New York Times had an editorial about Albany's, the legislature's effort to undermine this bill. What is your plan to fight this uh, effort? You know, this was something that we knew could happen, but would not expect it to happen so quickly. But the American Progressive Bag Alliance, which is the plastics industry's Industries Group has been working very hard in Albany, um, and it, the legislation definitely has some legs. Uh, we're hoping that it doesn't get through the Senate, um, but it's possible. You got uh, a big boost with a, a editorial from the New yes, York Times was, on Monday. I was very happy to wake up and on Monday and see that the that the bill was being that the state bill had an editorial by the New York Times editorial board um, against that state preemption bill saying to you know, give New York City a chance. So what about the money part? Is this a tax? I mean, the city's not getting out of it, much out of it directly. Uh, and so what's in it for the yeah, city? Yeah, I was going to bring that up um, at the very beginning. That, that the mon none of the money goes, to, goes to, the, to the city. All of the money stays with the retailer. And that's in large part because um, New York City doesn't have the authority to levy taxes. They need that authority from Albany. Uh, you're not and gonna get you're it. not going to get it there. <laughs> so New York City was very, the council um, made sure that all of the money stays with the retailer. But, but you know, that's worked in other places. M many other places have that. And the main reasoning behind this law is to reduce consumption overall. Um, it, would be, it would be nice. A lot of groups think it would be nice if that money would you know, go to some a fund that did some kind of you know environmental education cleanup, but that's just not possible. Given it would be considered an unconstitutional tax, probably. But also, too, this is a little bit confusing because uh, the merchants can charge more than five cents if they want mm -hmm. to. But they can right now. I mean, that's kind of that's an argument that's coming from the plastics industry as well, saying, oh well, it's a minimum charge. But right now we have places like IKEA that's charging, you know, I think it's 55 cents or something for their bags. They don't give away free bags. Um, some grocers like Aldi, Costco, right? And so we, well, Costco I think doesn't give you anything. <laughs> They're even more <laughs> difficult. But um, so those retailers that already have some kind of program in place, we didn't want to go in and say you have to you have to have a five cent option available. Um, it gives some some flexibility for that but we've seen that stores they don't want to make their customers mad I mean store any store right now could charge five cents or ten cents or whatever they'd like for their bag but they don't want to drive their customers somewhere else so we haven't seen where it's been an issue in other places where stores you know want to bump up higher than the minimum charge unless they the store has the option they could also say you know here's this price level of the standard bag or you can get this really nice one for 25 cents um, so we want to be able to have that option available but um, but right now they could charge whatever they want unfortunately we're out of time Jenny Romer thanks for joining us thanks for having me when we come back the first ever all Puerto Rican platoon are finally recognized for their contributions during the First World War. Before that, Crystal Lowe has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. El Diario La Prensa covers Ecuadorians in New York marching for temporary protected status following the devastating earthquake that struck their country this past April. Hundreds of Ecuadorians gathered in front of the offices of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services last Wednesday, requesting that the Secretary of State, John Kerry, and Secretary of Homeland Security, Jed Johnson, grant Ecuadorians temporary protected status. The TPS program was created as part of the Immigration Act of 1990 to allow foreigners coming from other countries affected by natural disasters and other emergencies to obtain work authorizations, licenses, and temporary protection. An estimated 65,000 Ecuadorians could qualify for TPS if the request is approved. Wednesday's demonstration was part of the TPS National Day of Action, during which Ecuadorian communities throughout the U.S. mobilized to petition the government for status. In other news from El Diario La Prensa, 
the Department of Aging recently launched a campaign with the slogan, Elder Abuse Hits Close to Home. The department is inviting seniors to report on what is being called a silent epidemic, as much of the abuse happens behind closed doors. Department of Aging Commissioner Donna Corrado says that the abuse can be psychological, physical, financial, or a matter of neglect. She adds that the campaign was created as a means of raising awareness of the issue while promoting existing services such as JASA, an organization dedicated to protecting the elderly from staying in abusive settings because they're scared. According to Amy Chalfai, the director of JASA, one out of every nine seniors in New York City is being abused. And for many, it's difficult to admit because in most cases, the abuse is coming from their children or grandchildren who are taking advantage of their vulnerability. Activists are urging the community to speak up and speak out by calling 311. Sing Tao Daily reports, New York City's Department of Health is introducing a new mental health program that may cause Sunset Park seniors to lose out on viable mental health services. The program to encourage active, rewarding lives or PEARLS will replace the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative, which is the current senior health program offered by the DOH. Under the DOH's new program, Sunset Park is not listed as an underserved community. As a result, activists say that it will not only be more difficult for seniors to receive mental health services, but the funding for current cases could also be stopped. Furthermore, because the Chinese community still treats mental illness as taboo, activists say that Chinese seniors rarely seek help voluntarily. So organizations such as GMHI rely heavily on reaching out to the community through mental health-related workshops and by introducing mental health awareness and the process of helping seniors apply for welfare. If PEARLS is adopted, GMHI will be terminated in July. And finally, the forward highlights a video that recently went viral. The clip features two Orthodox high school girls rapping and beatboxing about their future daughter's marriage prospects. Given the modesty rules that generally ban Orthodox women from singing in front of men, the video was disturbing to some while a delightfully unusual sight to others, mainly because the team's rhymes were surprisingly good. According to a brief summary provided on Genius.com, the girls were singing about Dor Yesharim, an orthodox genetic testing service that allows potential couples to check their risks for genetic diseases. Although Kaim Brown, the marketing director for Dor Yesharim, says that the non-for-profit is disturbed by the video, the anonymous girls in the video actually reached out to Dor Yesharim, stating that a friend put the rap online without their permission. Those were just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be right back. We are here today to honor the 65th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army. Or, as we prefer to say, the Boring Kinneers. Isn't that cool? Hey, man. Puerto Rico became a part of the United States in 1898, and soon after, Congress created a special unit of Puerto Rican soldiers. They went on to fight for our country valiantly in both world wars and in Korea. But throughout their service, they suffered persistent discrimination. For too long, their contribution to our history has been overlooked. So today, today, we are setting the record straight by giving them the highest award within our possession the Congressional Gold Medal. Thanks for staying tuned. We as journalists rarely get the chance to revisit stories, and when we do, things are sadly no better than the first time we covered them. But there's always an occasion when something good does emerge after we've covered a piece. It was around this time last year that we covered the story of filmmaker Noemi Figueroa, who directed and produced a film in an effort to get recognition for the 65th Regiment, the all Puerto Rican platoon from World War I. Since then, her efforts have borne fruit, and the regiment received the U.S. Congressional Gold Medal on April 13th of this year. Zafis Lebrun talked to Figueroa about what it means for her to have been involved in getting what some argue is long overdue recognition for these men. 
Noemi, thank you so much for being in studio today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So a year ago around this time, we talked to you about your film, The Barinconeers, and lots of big things have happened since we talked to you the last time. Um, you know, the gold medal has been awarded a couple of months ago. Congressional gold congressional, medal. Congressional gold medal mm -hmm. has been awarded. Um, what are your feelings about this? I mean, your film was in no small part helped contribute to this. Well, I do have to say that it was a, a large grassroots movement that covered um, many states and many organizations. Uh, and I was not the one that initiated the uh, Congressional Gold Medal campaign. But I would like to think that the film really had an impact, which is <coughs> amazing when you think that film can have an impact like that. You know, uh, motivate people, inspire people to go out and right or wrong. Because uh, President Obama signed the legislation into law in, on June 2014. But uh, the 65th Infantry Borinqueneers are the uh, second only Hispanic Americans to have received the Congressional Gold Medal other than Roberto Clemente, who received it in 1973. Now, how many years ago was that? And they're also the first Korean War unit, Korean War era unit, to receive the Congressional Gold Medal. So, um, you know, it's a dream come true. I mean, it's just exciting. These men deserved it, and um, the whole community is, is uh, inspired and our you know, I, I, it's hard to describe it. When I went to, I had the fortune to go uh, to the unveiling ceremony, which took place in Washington, D.C. on April 13th. And there were over 200 living Borinqueneers that attended and families of some of the deceased. But it felt like 200 fathers of mine were getting the medal. Not one, but 200. Right. Uh, and that's how I feel. Right. Right. Um, so these these men, who were they? I mean, to give a, the audience a sense of who these guys were, were they young and old? And Well, they're all mostly young. I mean, you know, it's like any wartime draft. You get, you know, 18, 19 year olds being sent to war. Um, they did have from different social classes. You had some uh, officers that uh, were maybe better educated or, you know, had um, some of them were uh, career uh, military people that had made the army their their careers, but most of them were young kids that, uh, with you know, very limited education, never been away from the island for the first time, been on a on a boat, you know, out of the country uh, to Korea it, with a grueling climate winter that they were not accustomed to, a foreign language in a foreign army because although they were American citizens serving in the U.S. Army, the language was Spanish. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Why was this uh, regiment created? The 65th was created um, in 1899, or the precursor of the 65th. At that time, it was called like a volunteer battalion, uh, and its primary purpose was to safeguard the island, you know, native troops to safeguard the island when the U.S. took over the island in 1898. So by 1899, uh, the precursor of the 65th was created. And then it grew as the years went by. Um, and they participated in World War I, uh, mostly sent to the Panama Canal for guard duty, participated in World War II, again, doing guard duty in the Panama Canal, but then they were also sent for the first time to Europe. And uh, the different three divisions were dispersed and mostly did maybe they safeguarded POW, German POWs, or the railroad tracks with munitions. But the 3rd Battalion did see some combat in the Maritime Alps, but limited combat. Because as a segregated unit, they were not really uh, interested in combat. And it wasn't until the Korean War that they really saw a lot of combat and, and made their mark mm -hmm. as uh, warriors. Mm -hmm. Now, you, um, before we got into the studio, you mentioned a very fascinating story to me about one particular um, one particular of these gentlemen. Could you tell us a yes. little bit about that story? His about name is uh, Brigadier General Walter McCoslin. He lives in Illinois, and I love his story. Um, and uh, he's a tall, uh, continental man, uh, blue eyes. And at the age of 15, um, he ran away from home and uh, joined the Army, lied about his age, ended up in Korea, and for some reason or another, ended up in the 65th Infantry Regiment, not speaking a word of Spanish. And this was during the time that the 65th was a Puerto Rican unit, primarily. 
It had not been, integ it had not been integrated. And uh, he says that the Puerto Rican soldiers adopted him, looked out after him. He was this tall 15-year-old kid. And uh, he probably confessed it to his chaplain. The chaplain contacted his mother. His mother did not know where her son was, contacted the army to get him out. And by the time the army you know, got him out, which was about 10 months later, he had already earned a Purple Heart. He had right. been wounded in combat. Wow. Yeah. But he has always this um, it, uh, sentimental endearment towards the soldiers of the 65th. He considers himself a Borinquenir, right. and he was there in um, D.C. to get his Congressional Gold Medal. He also went to the Pennsylvania event with his wife, um, and and he made the career, uh, the military, his career. His career he right. eventually retired as a, a colonel and, and as a brigadier general for. Wow. National Guard. That's an amazing story. Now, you mentioned the event in April, and then mm -hmm. you also said that there was an event in Pennsylvania. Well, there's a lot of uh, people have to understand that the Congress only paid for the minting of one gold medal. Uh, and that gold medal, after it has a, hopefully a museum tour next year, it will then be permanently housed in the Smithsonian Institution. So any replica medals that are being awarded to these veterans has to be raised, the money has to be raised by private contributions or corporate sponsors. There have been already various ceremonies. There was a gala reception on April 13th in DC where over 200 were awarded replica medals. A large event in the grounds of El Morro in Puerto Rico on April 27th, hundreds attended that one. Uh, there was one on Memorial Day, now May 30th in Pennsylvania. Uh, and we're organizing a New York ceremony for the uh, veterans of the New York, New Jersey tri-state area uh, for July 17th. I'm collaborating with the East Harlem Borinquenier's Honoring Committee, the Borinquenier's Congressional Gold Medal Alliance, uh, the co-sponsors. Uh, uh, we have a tentatively scheduled venue, which will be the School of uh, Silverman School of Social Work, which is at Hunter College on 119th Street in East Harlem, and our sponsor will be a uh, Center for Puerto Rican Studies. But that uh, is in the process of being um, approved, so it has to be approved. Um, and the Congressional Gold Medal uh, Ceremony National Committee, so many organizations, yeah. they're gonna you know, hopefully come with some other replica medals, but we still have to raise money, not only to purchase more re replica medals for the catering and so forth, so we created a GoFundMe page that we're hoping that we can get uh, support from the community. And we're also registering the veterans. You have to understand that many of them uh, have not even been identified. So uh, for those individuals who either have a Borinquenir veteran that's still living or has passed away, because we are honoring those, uh, giving medals to the families of those who have passed away, they should contact us also at uh, contact at borinquenirs.com. And uh, next May, they have approved this, but there's gonna be a street named in East Harlem called Borinquenir's Way. Right, I was gonna ask yeah. about that. What, so locally, um, what's happening with that? Is well, it, that was spearheaded by the East Harlem Borinquenir's Congressional, uh, the East Harlem Borinquenir's Honoring Committee, so many names, uh, and they had it approved. So on 102nd Street and Lexington Avenue, they will be n renaming that Borinquenir's Way. I think it's gonna take place uh, May of next year, but it's been approved. Uh, it's the only very, very inclined street, and it represents the hills that the uh, Borinquenia soldiers climbed in Korea and in Puerto Rico, probably. And, and the they purposely hills. selected that street because of that. All right. Well, Noemi, uh, I'm being told that we're out of time. I know it went by in a flash, I correct? Um, but it's really good to, for you to come in, and it's so often that you don't get a chance to talk about stories and revisit them and good things have happened. And yes. I'm happy that you were able to come in and tell us the story. Well, you know, not all the news that's out there about Puerto Rico is negative. And this is a wonderful, positive story that people need to remember about the service and the sacrifice of these soldiers. All right, well, thanks again for coming in. Thank you. You can learn more about the 65th Regiment and Figueroa's film by visiting the website, theborucraneers.com. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.